On today's episode of the Mark Titus Show, we are a little more than four weeks away from Selection Sunday, and I am no closer to understanding this dumb sport. Uh, since we last did a real show, so we did the uh, Chris Holtman emergency firing podcast uh, a couple days ago, um, and uh, I, I have some thoughts, by the way. I, at, at the end of this show, I'm going to do some cleanup with that. Not just, I don't know, whatever developments. Whatever, I, I, I've had some time to sit down and think about it. We, we recorded that like 10 minutes, literally 10 minutes after the news broke. Um, and now that I've slept on it, um, I have some more thoughts that I'd like to share and some different things I, I'll touch up on uh, at the end of this one. Uh, but yeah, since we last did a real show, which has been a, basically a week now, uh, Tennessee got rocked at Texas A&M. But then A&M loses to Vanderbilt, uh, who's not good. Auburn smoked Bama uh, going into the last show that we did. But then they turn around and get their asses handed to them by Florida. But then the next game, South Carolina, who's now ranked 11th, comes, comes to Auburn. Auburn beats them by literally 40 points. Uh, North Carolina drops another one at Syracuse. It's their third loss in five games. The rumors of Carolina's locker room troubles, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how true they are, but you know, when, when those those rumblings are happening and you're seeing a team lose three of five when they, they felt like they were national title good, uh really makes you scratch your head. Kansas just lost by twenty nine at Texas Tech, no Kevin McCuller. Uh, but you know, still, be that as it may, losing by twenty nine when you're Kansas is uh not something that Jayhawk fans are, are used to. Uh so yeah, it, it I guess it I guess the takeaway is that losing on the road is hard. Um uh, maybe that's what we need to focus on. But also Gonzaga, since we last did a show, went to Rupp Arena, got the, a much needed W uh at Kentucky, um and and gave Kentucky their first three game home losing streak since nineteen sixty seven. Uh, it, which never happened in Rupp Arena history, Kentucky losing three straight. Um Arizona sweeps the mountain trip uh, in the Pac-12, they go to Utah, they go to Colorado back-to-back, win both of those games, blew out Colorado. First time in nine years Arizona's done that, going back-to-back in the mountain trip. Pitt beats Virginia and Charlottesville. So, yeah, just exa- right when you're thinking you have some sort of semblance of understanding of, of what's going on in this sport, uh, there's another data point that, that rears its ugly head and says, no, you're wrong. There is, none of this makes any, any damn sense. Uh, having said all that, the Super Bowl was on Sunday, and uh, – the way I like to think of the world is that uh, the sports world is that everybody was focused on football. Football is now done. Uh, the, the nation now turns its eyes to basketball. A lot of NBA fans out there, obviously, but the NBA playoffs are, are very far away uh, still. Um, and March Madness is quickly approaching. So for today's show, I am doing a, a breakdown, a, a primer uh, for all the football fans. If you're a football fan that, that has an interest in college basketball but find yourself throughout – football season devoting most of your time on a Saturday or a Sunday to watching NFL or college football uh and and you know when March rolls around you are interested in in March Madness but it's kind of hard to get into the sport because you haven't been following it all year you're in luck I'm going to get you up to speed on this season of college basketball today uh I'm going to hit all the bullet points of all the things you kind of need to know uh as we as we get ready to get into March four weeks away basically uh this Sunday we will be four weeks away from selection Sunday it is coming up fast um I, I again I have no idea what the hell to expect but we're going to do our best to try to explain this college basketball season to a football fan that's what we're doing on the show today let's get into it all right I'm going to do my best to stay organized with this I, I do have a little bit of an outline I'm going off of um but you know I, I who the hell knows where this thing is going to uh, end up going um I'm going to start with the biggest storylines of this season just big broad uh vibes of what this season is um, what what the, the the temperature on the season are are there a lot of good teams are there bad teams is the basketball sloppy um, it, it always is it's college basketball if 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 you hate sloppy basketball you've never really been into college basketball I I, I don't think uh, that's that's a feature not a bug in college basketball um, so the the biggest storylines to me were this uh, the the number one bullet point I have written down is that top ten teams are losing on the road to unranked teams at an unprecedented rate. This is something that uh, has been tracked like all season. College basketball is like a, a head scratcher, and it's kind of not gotten any better. It's slightly getting I, – I, I haven't checked the stat. Uh, I, I tried to pull it up today, and, and I had like a bad number from a couple days ago, and, and um, I, I don't know where we're at now. I think it's like hovering right at 500, that top 10 teams – go on the road, play unranked teams, and I think they're 500 on the season this year, which is the worst winning percentage kind of ever. Like this since they I, – I, I, going back God knows how many years. Um, so that that is a big 
uh, uh, thing that is happening this year in college basketball is that top 10 teams are, are losing on the road to unranked teams. Big, huge, like, program. it feels like program-changing wins for some of these schools that are unranked and they're knocking off these top 10 teams. But then it's happening so often that you kind of step back and you're like, are, are, are the pollsters wrong? Like, how are they screwing up? Uh, all these top 10 rankings so much or is it that there's parity in the sport I think it's more the parity part I think the the unranked teams that are pulling off these upsets are actually very good and the days of uh, being an unranked team the, the days of losing to an unranked team being an embarrassment are, are long gone uh, there used to be a time where being ranked um, not that it, it meant something but like it it being ranked was like indicative of like you are very very good and uh, it, it's the haves and have nots and these are the these are the 25 that are very good and the rest of them are you know there are some teams that are good that are knocking on the door but basically if you're an unranked team you go sit over here and let the the adult table handle all the business that needs to be handled in college basketball that's not the case this year it is it is the i, I would say like the top 60ish teams can all beat each other on any given night um there's definitely some some tiering and obviously some teams are better than others, but uh, yeah, you could, you can get embarrassed very easily uh, against a team that's unranked against a team that's frankly doesn't have a great record against a team that might not even be in the NCAA tournament. Um, So that, that to me is like a big uh, bullet point, a big thing worth pointing out to people is that the parody it's, it, it always feels high in college basketball. It always feels like, I mean that's that's the reason people are drawn to the sport is March Madness rolls around and anybody can beat anybody and um, you just never know what's going to happen all those things. Uh, it is an overdrive this year. The, the the parody is 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 very much through the roof this year and uh, that's setting up for it should set up for what's going to be an awesome NCAA tournament. So that that's bullet point number one is the top ten teams continue to lose to unranked teams. So if you're someone, especially if you're someone that likes throwing money on these games, um, and and you're saying to yourself, oh the the number six team in the country is playing a they're playing an unranked team tonight. I'm sure this will be a, a breeze. Uh, I would I would double check that you know what you're doing before you uh, just assume that the little number next to the team means anything really this year because it, it it certainly hasn't so far. Uh, the other the other big bullet point I have written down and this this is more important probably than the first one. Um, this is the year of the cold ass white boy in college basketball. It is it is taking over the country. Uh, there are cold ass white boys everywhere you look. Um, some names I'm going to throw out for you. Dalton Connect is the one that I've I've been in love with all season since really before the season. Uh, I watched a Tennessee Tennessee played like a, a scrimmage that was televised at Michigan State, and Dalton Connect is like the uh, uh, a six eight score. He's the best pure scorer in college basketball. Uh, but he uh, he balled out against Michigan State. Fell in love with his game immediately. Um, doesn't play great defense, which has become kind of a point of contention with him and Rick Barnes at times like he's he's not really like a, he doesn't really fit the Tennessee basketball culture which is why he was brought in in the first place because Tennessee basketball culture is turn every game into a rock fight and not have any ability whatsoever to score the basketball so they brought him in uh, as a transfer from northern Colorado um, he is a scoring machine he is a guy who uh We've said on the show all year, like he's the one guy in college basketball that when he's hot, you want to call your friends and be like, dude, you got to throw the game on. Connect has 23 at halftime or whatever else. Like he he has, there's no limit in my mind of what he is capable of on the offensive end. Like if you told me that Dalton Connect had 55 points in a game, um, I would certainly think that's like a legendary performance and it's awesome. And like that's not something that happens a lot in college basketball, even though in the NBA it seems to happen once a week at least. Um I, I I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't be like oh ho hum I, I would be like that's insane but I also would not be surprised at all because Dalton Connect is that good uh and and the way he plays is just he's just got swagger oozing out of his pores and he's never rattled and he just like I don't know he's he's a guy that that I certainly have fallen in love with this year and uh, if you have not watched him I I think you will too uh so Dalton Connect is one Braden Smith point guard for Purdue uh when I originally did the cold ass white boy power rankings I said uh, no Purdue players could be on it. Because uh, if you play for Purdue, by definition, you're not a cold-ass white boy. I still kind of believe that, if mm-hmm. I'm being honest. But I love Braden Smith so much, and um, he deserves some sort of recognition. He is uh, one of the best point guards in the country. Last year, if you watched Purdue, uh, you you he's the same kid. He's the same point guard last year. So, um, you know, a lot of people's memory of Purdue basketball is their guard play wasn't good enough in March, and that certainly was the case. So you're saying – if this is the same kid as last year, how can I believe in him? Well, he was a f- true freshman last year. He's not this year. 
And uh, I think his confidence has just absolutely exploded this year to where uh, his freshman year it felt like he was more trying to set the table, more um, almost like overthinking being a point guard where he's trying to be pass first a little too much. He's trying to – it was it was almost like important to him that he um, gets the label of like a, a true point guard or whatever. And this year I think he's just like – He's just a basketball player. He just makes plays, dude. He just gets the ball in his hands. He he can score. He can pass. He can. He he's he's not like a great defender, but he's heady about it. And he, uh, um, you know, he makes plays on that end. Uh, he he's just like he's he's turned from like a almost uh, like last year. It almost felt like he was like a little cerebral about it, which sometimes is a good thing with a point guard. But like I didn't love it with from him as a true freshman because he's like overthinking stuff and you just kind of want him to go out there and hoop. This year he's hooping and he is so fucking good, dude. Uh, so Braden Smith's another one. Tyler Kolick is a name that if you've paid attention to college basketball the last couple of years, uh, you already know his name. He's still around. He's at Marquette. Um, he just had a monster game of Butler and he is, boy, if you want to talk about like attitudes of cold-ass white boy, he is like number one. And then so like he, he it's not even close to me. Like he uh he had the quote last week where he was talking about uh um he used the phrase barbecue chicken in a in a post game press conference and the reporters like what does that mean? Because he said he like got his mismatch and then from there it was barbecue chicken and the reporters like what is that <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? Um but that's Tyler Kolick, dude. Big uh talk out of the side of his mouth guy, which is a which is a mark of a cold ass white boy. Um, but he could do it all, dude. He could shoot it. He could put it on the deck and and make plays. Great passer. Averages like seven assists a game. Um, hits floaters. Hits like hits those bizarre. Sh- does the deal where he's driving to the basket, leans into you, and like flips it up from his hip, and and it always finds a way to go in. Um, he he's he's got. I I don't use this phrase often because I uh, I don't know how it's gonna sound coming out of my mouth, but. He's got a he he's he's got a deep bag. We'll we'll put it that way. Tyler Kolick has. That's not something that I say often. It's probably not something I no, that's sh- cool. should get comfortable saying. But that's how I feel about Tyler Kolick. Um, who else? Cam Spencer at UConn uh, was at Rutgers last year. With TJ's guy. So um, yeah, he was he was kind of at Rutgers. And TJ, you can correct me if I'm wrong. He was yeah. at times like your offense. He was just like I would say from the first day of the season to late January. He was yeah. our entire offense. And yeah. then he had a stretch of games where he scored like two zero five eight one points, and that's when our season fell off a cliff. So yeah. he, the whole season he was our entire offense. He uh so he, he was he was that for Rutgers, decided uh he wants to you no know, offense to T J, but he like wants yeah. to, to play for something bigger than uh just beating Purdue at home every year. Um so he <laughs> or on the road. You guys actually won in Mackey when they were number yep. number one. Um so he transferred to UConn. UConn needed a guy to replace Jordan Hawkins, I think, um, who obviously was was awesome on the national championship team last year as a sh- knockdown shooter. Uh, so they go to the transfer portal, get Camp Spencer, and he has been lights out for them. And it's not just that he's a great shooter. He's a playmaker. He is uh, a tough son of a bitch. He's a shit talker. He's a... He's a guy. He's a he's a he does a Hulk Hogan like cup his ear to get the crowd go. I can't hear you type shit. Getting the crowd hyped. He's 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 Danny Hurley um, on the basketball court and just a great fit. He's one of those dudes that like he's gonna play one year at UConn. UConn might win a national championship, go back to back, and even if they don't, Final Four, whatever. It seems like UConn's poised for a deep tournament run again. And uh, Cam Spencer is probably gonna play like one year there. And it's going to feel like, as we look back on it, like five or six years from now, that he did four years there because he's just he, he's that. It feels so right for him to be at UConn that we're going to misremember his college basketball career as though he was there forever. Um, but he's a cold ass white boy for sure. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Damask at, at Illinois. Uh, so t- Illinois, uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. had a uh, like a sexual assault uh, allegation situation um, where he he missed. A little bit of time then there was i don't know i'm not a legal expert i don't i don't know all the specifics of everything but he he, he basically got reinstated because of a restraining order type thing like whatever the the i, I don't know it was a he said she said all, all that bullshit but terrence shannon was basically suspended and then unsuspended um and he's back but the point is like while terrence shannon was suspended for illinois marcus damask uh, was carrying that offense and he was he was lights out for them and i it's kind of carried over since then he's been He's a guy that uh, is definitely the definition of a cold ass wife. Well, another guy that could just like drop thirty on you on any given night. Uh, and then Reed Shepard is one too that I fell in love with really early. Freshman kid at Kentucky. Um, his dad Jeff Shepard, most outstanding player for the Wildcats back in the nineties. Uh, in the in the 
on one of those national title teams. Um, he's incredible. He's, he's a McDonald's All-American who, at the start of the season, it felt like he was the best player on the team. I still... I mean, we could talk. About, we're going to talk about a lot of these guys later. Rob Dillingham is is up there. Like Reed Shepard, there are nights where it's like he's the best player on the team. I wouldn't be surprised if if could, this Kentucky team is loaded with talent and and they're, they're going to have a lot of future NBA players as they usually do. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Reed Shepard does end up being the best uh, NBA player of the bunch. He he's just he, he's he's so poised and confident at, at every second he's on the floor. He, uh, you know, there are times where he does look like he's a freshman and he does make some boneheaded plays, but, um, there's nothing he can't do. And there's, there's, he, he, he had a stretch, uh, the other day against, uh, um, when they, when they lost at home to Gonzaga, he had a stretch where like he blocks like a, a jump shot, brings it down, like makes like a hezzy move, gets fouled, throws it, finishes through contact, um, He's just he's he's nasty. He's he's absolutely nasty, and uh, his draft stock is really funny because he very much looks like a choir boy. He looks like a like the the racial bias that's going to come into play when you're trying to break down how good Reed Shepard is is going to be hysterical to watch because I think people watch him play basketball and they're like this dude should be a lottery pick, especially in a weak weak draft. This NBA draft is not great, um, and it makes sense to me that Reed Shepard, like talent wise, he he can he can do it all. Uh, but when you look at him, you're like, but do we really want, like, he's like 6'2", six 6'3", six like he's, he kind of looks like a, he doesn't look like he's, I don't, I don't know. And, and, and it's, it's solely just because of how he looks and like, he doesn't look super athletic. And, uh, there's a lot of reasons to start scratching your head as to how he's that good. Um, but he is, he is that good. He's, he's incredible. He comes off the bench for Kentucky, um, but uh, yeah, Reed Shepard's another guy. He's a cold ass white boy. And then Baylor Shireman is is another one I threw down on the list. He plays at Creighton. Uh, was on the Creighton team last year that went to the Elite Eight. Left handed guard, uh, a bigger body for a guard. Um, has the has the swagger. Has 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 everything. He never met a shot he did he didn't like. Uh, unlimited range. Um, unbelievable rebounder. Big time shit talker. But he talks like to the other team he talks to his teammates and he talks to himself he's one of those guys which like feels like a little bit of a psychopath but uh, i love it like he's he's a guy who like will talk to himself to get himself going um he's awesome he's he's he he just put up a triple double the other night i think um for for creighton this creighton team's a little bit of a disappointment but uh baylor shireman is 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 that dude so uh that's my list right now of cold ass white boys i didn't really power rank him or anything but i just those are guys uh th- this is the year of the cold ass white boy that's that's just the ultimate bullet point i wanted to share is that uh there yeah. there are a lot of cold ass white boys out there just just bringing it every fucking night and it is it is very funny to watch because uh this is not the norm in in the basketball world obviously right <laughs> I, I uh i don't know if you have this later on in your breakdown but indiana state's cold ass white boys mm-hmm. do we have a is that yeah we'll be talking about him okay, in yeah, a little bit yeah that's tough. robbie yeah we'll be talking about him um so what else? Uh, conference wise, uh, the SEC to me is the most interesting conference. So uh, Alabama right now is currently in first place in the conference, uh, but they just lost by eighteen to Auburn. Uh, they they played at Auburn. They, they've already played twice. They beat Auburn at home, and then they they lost uh, by eighteen at Auburn just last week. Um, and they're kind of gimmicky, which uh, I wouldn't even say kind of. They are. They're 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 a gimmicky basketball team in the sense that they their whole thing at Bama is. Um, just push tempo and and shoot as many threes as possible and trust that eventually you're going to make enough shots and and you know they they you're going to make enough threes that it it even the misses get come out in the wash and you get enough shots up that like that's kind of how they approach it it's like a video game um and in the past i i you know like last th- this has been nato's thing for a while and in the past i i haven't had that much of a problem with it because they've had very talented guys and they also like play defense. Brandon Miller is, was great for them last year and, and Herb Jones was great for them and um, Betty Ako is great for them and, and they have like dudes I that, that can that can guard so like it makes it a little more palatable for me as a neutral viewer to, to trust that uh, when the NCAA tournament rolls around that they're going to be able to, you know, if, even if they're not making threes, they're still going to find a way to, to win these games. Now last year, uh, against San Diego State, they did not do that, and it it drove me fucking crazy. But um, that uh, that notwithstanding, uh, that still throughout the season last year, you could see like different iterations of Alabama and how this could 
lead to a national championship, a Final Four, whatever else. This year's team, very good. Top of the SEC. Mark Sears is is awesome. Uh, Grant Nelson is, has been up and down, but when he's on, he's he's really great. Um, Ryland Griffin's a, a great basketball player. They, they have a ton of talent. Uh, I don't think they play defense. I don't think they have the, the top-end NBA caliber guys either, and I think that's what's missing with them and why it feels a little more gimmicky this year. But at the same time, they are at the top of the SEC, but that's why the SEC is so fascinating to me because Bama's at the top. I can kind of poke holes in them and say I don't love them, but I also respect how good they are and, and how they're winning. Um, Auburn is the best team maybe in the country at home. Auburn, when they were playing at home, holy shit, look out. They could beat any – they could beat – they could beat the Nuggets. They could beat the Denver Nuggets at home. I'm going to go out and say that, that if, if the Nuggets had to play in the jungle, all, I like Auburn to win that game. Um, but, you know, the NCAA tournament's not played in Auburn, Alabama, so that becomes a little dicey. And uh, Auburn has not always looked awesome away from home. They're still a very good team. But, like, I've been I've been going in circles trying to make sense of whether this is, like, a, a team that could actually get to a Final Four or whether it's just, like, a really good – because Auburn's been, like, a little bit of a surprise this year. Like, they weren't expected to be as good as they are. Um, so I don't know if this is, like, a legit Final Four good team or if Auburn is just uh, a fun story that, like, they'll look back on. They'll make a Sweet 16, and they'll be like, that was a hell of a year. Nobody thought we could do anything, and look at us. We finished second in the SEC and made the Sweet 16. Uh, I, I go back and forth on that, but – they're they're right there with Bama. Uh, could could very much win the league. Tennessee is the team that I keep saying is the best team in the conference, um, and I can't quit them because when they're on, they they do look like they could. They do not that they could win a national title. That they probably will win a national title. I mean, it, like when Tennessee is rolling and they're playing as good a defense as they can, and Dalton Connect is is uh, you know on fire, and Zakai Ziegler is joining them. They they do look. Like they could beat anybody, and they should be the favorites to win the national championship. Um, but when it gets bad, it gets really ugly. It gets, it can get, it can still. They still have that Tennessee ugliness to them, where uh, the wheels can fall off, and I don't love that. I don't love that. But uh, you know, I, I Tennessee might finish third in the conference, and I'll still probably be saying that I think they're the best team in the SEC, just because uh, I can't. I, I do think that when they're rolling. I mean, they hung their, their whole thing is defense, and they hung over 100 points on Kentucky, who I know can't guard anybody. But still, to go into Rupp Arena and hang 100 when um, you supposedly, as a program, can't score the basketball, that's 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 insane. So I think Tennessee is is an interesting team. South Carolina has been a fun surprise. They they have won a ton of games, but they literally just lost by 40 points at Auburn. Um, they're they're up there though in the mix of of who could win the SEC. Kentucky has by far the most talent, maybe not by far. Kentucky has the most talent of all the SEC teams. This feels like a vintage John Calipari team, and yet Kentucky continues to just like shit down their leg, and John Calipari continues to like pull his hair out and look stressed as hell because he can't quite figure his team out and it the, the narrative really is it's not even starting to form it's there it's right at the doorstep that John Calipari is fucking this team up and is a terrible in-game coach and that's where we're at with Kentucky they're still going to make the tournament but uh Kentucky has all the pieces they need to go on a deep NCAA tournament run they should be winning the SEC or, or very near the top of the standings um and it and it's we're trending towards this just being a disappointing Kentucky season uh, Mississippi State has one of the best defenses in the country. Uh, Florida's Florida's got a really good team. So the SEC to me um, is the most interesting because I have – there really are one, two, three, four, five, probably five, probably cap it at five, five teams that could win this league still. Um, and, and we're in mid-February. So uh, that, that makes the SEC the most interesting conference, even though, you know, the Big East is, is very good. It's just UConn has a stranglehold on it right now, and, and it feels a little more top-heavy with, with UConn and Marquette. Um, and and the Big 12 is the deepest league, but, you know, it's it's Kansas's conference, and Kansas is not having a great year, but Houston is, and it just sort of it, it has, like, sort of the same feel as the Big East, where it's a little top-heavy, even though the Big 12 race is still competitive. Um, I'm, I'm I, It feels like it might be Houston's to lose. Uh, and then the ACC, next bullet point I wrote down, the ACC and the Big Ten are terrible. That's something that needs to be uh, stressed to the, the casual college basketball viewer. Um, I don't know how it happened. I don't know why it happened. The ACC has kind of been trending down uh, a little bit anyway. Uh, you know, maybe it's the coaching legends that, that were lost, Mike Bray. And, and everybody forgets about, about Mike Bray, by the way. Uh, Roy Williams and Coach K and, and Bayheim um, get all the headlines for the coaches that stepped down. But Mike Bray did too. And uh, I don't know if it's that. 
Um, I don't know if it's like conference realignment with football where like somehow the money from all these TV contracts or, you know, like the ACC is obviously kind of the redheaded stepchild of the power conferences at times when you're talking about all this stuff. And um, I, I don't know if that's factoring in, but whatever the case may be, uh, the ACC and the Big Ten are both really bad to me in, in my estimation. Like I think there are some silver linings. And if you're a fan of, say, like a North Carolina or a Duke or – whatever else you're like hey wait a second our team's not that bad um we're competing on on a national scale and you are but like you you, you kind of know that like this carolina team is not as good as as the other great carolina teams have been and duke's the same thing and um just across the board the acc has a lot of teams that uh could win a game or two in the ncaa tournament hell there might be a team like miami that gets hot and and goes on a final four run but i as it stands right now i I thought North Carolina might be a national title contender. Um, I I've I have no choice but to walk that back after the last few games. I mean, they've lost three of five at this point. So um, I'm not sure the the ACC has any. Duke Duke should be. Duke has a ton of talent. I can't I can't really believe that Duke's going to win six NCAA tournament games. I, I don't I don't think that this Duke team is going to do that. Um, they should be able to. If you line them up one by one in a vacuum, I like Duke to win any individual game. I just don't know if they have the mental fortitude to pull off six in a row. So uh, that's the, that's the ACC. And then on the big 10 side, it's a lot of the same where like a team like Wisconsin or a team like an Illinois emerges as like a secondary team to Purdue. Uh, and then just as quickly as they emerge, they just fall back into the pack. And the big 10 is, is eating itself alive. And um, it's really just Purdue and everybody else. So of the ACC and the big 10, I would say Purdue is like the only team that really stands out, and uh, that's where we're at with all the conference talk. Quick break to talk about our friends at Body Armor. The Mark Titus Show is brought to you by Body Armor. Real hydration, real ingredients packed with electrolytes, vitamins, and nothing artificial. Body Armor has great-tasting flavors like strawberry banana and blue raspberry. And not only do we hydrate here at Barstool with Body Armor, but some of the best athletes in the world do as well, like Christian McCaffrey, Joe Burrow, Ronald Acuna Jr., C.D. Lamb, and Bryce Young. My favorite flavor has been the cherry lime. I've been talking about it for a while now. Uh, it, I, I love drinking a cherry lime when I need a little. It's weird. I, I drink it as like a snack almost. Like I get done with my day. I'm at home. Um, I don't want to eat like a bag of chips and stuff. And the cherry lime is so good. And it's such a such a great drink with packed full of electrolytes and the anti antioxidants and the B vitamins and all that all that good stuff. And it tastes like it's like a nice little snack for me, and it tastes delicious. It's great. I love the cherry lime. Um, all the flavors are great, though. I was strawberry banana once upon a time. I'll probably go through a strawberry banana phase again. But Body Armor is available in stores nationwide. You can head over now to the Body Armor store on Amazon and get yours today. Body Armor, go do it. Go drink it. It's the best. Body Armor. All right, so that's the uh, that's pretty much the con- the Power Conference standing um, how I feel about each one. Uh, the Pac-12, I guess I should say, is not great, but that's kind of to the surprise of nobody. Um, but, yeah, if, if you're somebody that uh, was watching college football this year and you thought, wow, this is pretty cool that the Pac-12 was so good in its final year and it's going out, you know, swinging, um, I wonder if the basketball version of the Pac-12 will do that. Uh, the answer is no. No, they won't. Uh, Arizona's good, but – Rest of the league, uh, not exactly great this year. So, uh, yeah, the ACC, Big Ten are pretty bad. Um, the Pac-12 is too. Big East is awesome. Big 12 is awesome. SEC is, I think, awesome. Pretty intriguing. Um, yeah, and that, and that's where the conferences stand. Uh, another thing of note, Gonzaga's on the bubble. Uh, Gonzaga's made every tournament since 1998. Every single tournament that has been played since 1998 – the Gonzaga Bulldogs have taken part, and uh, for for a uh, program that has a reputation of choking, which I don't, I think most people have have moved past that, but they they obviously have never won a national championship, so there is a perception that Gonzaga can't get it done on the NCAA tournament. It should be pointed out that they have made eight straight Sweet Sixteens and have gone to five Elite Eights in the last eight years. So Gonzaga being on the bubble is certainly noteworthy because as much as people like to pretend like Gonzaga is not that great. Uh, Gonzaga is always in the tournament, and they are always moving on in the tournament. And this year they are on the bubble. Um, but they're probably on the right side of the bubble. They just won at Kentucky in Rupp Arena in a game they had to have. Uh, the reason that didn't really fully get them off the bubble is because Kentucky isn't quite as good uh, as 
it felt like they were going to be. Like there was a moment there where it felt like if Gonzaga wins and Rupp, that'll like make their season pretty much, and they'll be a lock to be in the tournament. I still expect them to be in. Um, they would take like losing to to some of these WCC teams that aren't very good. St. Mary's is good. That that would be a fine loss. Uh, and and ultimately, Gonzaga always finds a way to do this. Like they've been on the bubble in the past, and they always win the WCC tournament. They always find a way in. Uh, that's how you make every single tournament since 1998. But as it stands right now in mid February. I just thought that would be of note. That is something to watch develop. If you are a, a college basketball fan, you're used to seeing Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament, which most of us are. It's happened every year for uh, 25 years now. Um, they are on the bubble, and there is a there is a world in which Gonzaga does not make this NCAA tournament, and that's something to monitor. Uh, and then the last thing I wrote down uh, that that's becoming a thing in college basketball. This is more like off season stuff, but it is going to be interesting as the last month or so of the season progresses is the uh the coaching change spotlight so ohio state my alma mater just fired our coach chris holtman uh and and that in and of itself is you know it's it's something but is it's not necessarily indicative of a bigger thing except for um west virginia has been coaching with an interim coach all season long uh louisville has had a a sitting duck of a of a coach all season long in kenny Payne. i mean i think louisville fans Every single time Louisville takes the floor, it's Louisville fans are praying it's the last time Kenny Payne is on the sideline, and yet he continues to, to coach that basketball team. So there's an expectation that he will be fired. Uh, Jawan Howard at Michigan, very interesting situation. I think all Michigan fans are fed up with him. They're ready for him to go. The AD doesn't seem as anxious to get rid of Jawan Howard. It is dicey because he is a as a legend. He has the tie to the Fab Five, obviously, as he was a member of the Fab Five. But like having the Fab Five be a part of Michigan basketball is very important to that program. So if you cut, if you fire Jawan Howard, does the whole Fab Five turn their back on Michigan? Uh, it's a really dicey situation. They really should have just fired him when he when he struck a man in the face. Uh, I don't know why they didn't do that because now they they've backed themselves into a corner. But there's an expectation that that or maybe not an expectation. There's there's a um, there's Michigan may fire Jawan Howard. We'll just put it that way. If they're going off of, off of performance, they will fire Jawan Howard after the season. Um, Villanova could could be open. Uh, NC State could be open. Oklahoma State. Uh, I'm bringing all this up. like it's not as it's not as interesting i guess if you only care about march madness um but it could just get interesting because of the trickle down of all this now ohio state firing chris holtman makes it interesting because i think there are a lot of smart people in college basketball that see what this coaching carousel is going to be they, they see the horizon and they see that like this is going to get pretty fucking crazy and that um a lot of big time programs are going to have coaching vacancies uh and so what's interesting to me with Ohio State firing Chris Holtman midseason when uh, you know he could have just finished out the season and we're not making the tournament anyway, and it's kind of irrelevant. You could have just waited to the end of the year, saved some money because his buyout, I think on April 1st, his buyout drops. So like, why not just wait till then? And I guess the reason they don't wait till then is because you get a jump start on this whole process because if uh, you know the way you think about like an NBA draft, like this coaching carousel – this particular offseason is setting up to be like one of the great NBA drafts, you know, like this is like the Oh three draft class of, of coaches where it's like, they're going to be a ton of, of great programs that have open jobs. There are a lot of great up and coming coaches that have had successes, have, have, have had success at their uh, current spot, but aren't necessarily fully married to the spot they're at. And if it, and it stands to reason that you could pry them away. It's not like a deal where, you know, you're never getting Roy Williams away from North Carolina. You're never getting, I guess Roy Williams might be a bad example because Carolina did get him away from Kansas. But, um, you know, it's not like, it's not like there are a lot of coaches out there that are just fully ingrained in their programs. Uh, a lot of these successful coaches could be pried away and, uh, that makes it very interesting. So that's something to monitor because uh, Ohio State, West Virginia are already open. I expect Louisville to be open. I do expect Michigan to be open. Villanova, NC State, Oklahoma State all should probably fire their coaches. Uh, I think Indiana could. Indiana is another very interesting one because um, Indiana is not having a great year at all. They're they're probably going to miss the NCAA tournament unless something crazy happens. Um, and Mike Woodson was brought into Indiana to basically just make the NCAA tournament. I mean, Archie Miller was there, and and Indiana was abysmal. They couldn't. Th it looked a lot like what this year's Indiana team looks like. Uh, just disgust. Not only were they bad, they were just playing disgusting, unfun to watch basketball. And on top of it, they were losing. It's one thing if you play like a grueling rock fight style of basketball, but you're still winning games. Um, 
to do it to do that and lose is is brutal. But Mike Woodson did make two tournaments in a row. There was, you know, he did beat Purdue. Uh, he swept Purdue last year. Uh, he had great players in like Jalen Hood, Shafino, and Trace Jackson Davis who were fun to watch. And there was like some excitement to the program. And he's getting recruits and and whatever. Like he he kind of has done a decent job all told over the course of his three years at Indiana. He's done a good job of bringing the program back into the national spotlight. This year has gone horribly wrong for them, but um, Indiana finds themselves in an interesting situation because uh, if, if you, you can't really fire Mike Woodson in a vacuum, that's, that would be just insane. That'd be an insane thing to do. You gave a guy three years. He's a former legend as a player at that place. Uh, he, he's, he's, he has NBA head coaching experience. If you fire Mike Woodson, you are basically telling the rest of the college basketball world, we are an insane bas- We are an insane program that has unrealistic expectations and one down year will get any of our coaches fired. So I don't think you can do that at the same time. Uh, Woodson is, is very stubborn. Um, he, he kind of runs the program like it is an NBA program where like they will get their ass kicked and he kind of shrugs his shoulders and he's like, whatever, which works in the NBA when you're playing 82 games does not work at college. Um, and, but, but, but more to the point, I find the Indiana situation fascinating because with all of the, the, the hot young coaches, you know, and all these, these power, these big time programs, uh, needing coaches, it's very compelling because Dusty May at Florida Atlantic, who went to the national, uh, went to the Final Four last year, almost made the national championship before San Diego State, uh, you know, hit the last second shot to beat FAU. Dusty May went to Indiana. It, it is, it stands to reason that eventually Dusty May is going to take the Indiana job when it comes over. If you are, if the Indiana, if Indiana University offers Dusty May the job, he will take it. I mean, there's that that seems like a given, but. I feel like this is setting up to be Dusty May's last year at FAU, and if say an Ohio State, a West Virginia, a Michigan, a Villa, who have all of these awesome programs step up to the plate and call Dusty May, and he takes one of those, and Indiana misses out on like an obvious guy. Dusty May went to school there, was a manager there, um, you know, lives and breathes Indiana basketball when when you know he was he was at school there and all that. Um, if if IU misses out on that, how how big of a deal is that? So that that's what makes Indiana interesting. Kentucky's interesting as well. I don't think they're going to fire John Calipari. I do wonder if there's going to be convers like if this Kentucky team, as talented as they are, if if uh, you know it, it it ends in a second round loss. If Kentucky ends up getting like a they finish fifth in the SEC, they get a nine seed, they lose in the second round or something. Um, is there a conversation in private where they're just like, John, how much do you really want to do this? And there's kind of a nudge into retirement. There's a nudge into the NBA. There's a nudge into whatever's next. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Uh, and then you have like you have situations like Mick Cronin at UCLA and Eric Musselman at Arkansas and Greg McDermott at Creighton and Jerome Tang at Kansas State where like there's – there's a little too much noise about like whether they like it there or not. I think Cronin of the of that list, Cronin likes it in, at UCLA the most of those four. But um, you know, it's 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 a weird it's it's a weird fit. It's a weird time in UCLA sports right now. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm only mentioning all this to say that like that's kind of the subplot of where we're at with college basketball. Where we have March coming up, and March Madness is going to be awesome. But there's kind of this undercurrent of a coaching carousel coming that is is going to flip the sport on its head i think i don't know maybe not maybe it's just like a couple of these jobs open and and it's ultimately not that big of a deal but there are a lot of a lot of big time programs um that are that are like top 20 jobs in college basketball that i i think could be open uh in in this offseason so uh those are the big things that i i wrote down to watch Shout out to our friends at Roback Activewear. You guys all know how much we love Roback. Best fit, best feel. We can't go anywhere without seeing someone wearing a Roback Performance hoodie. I have, I think, six of these now. Um, they're the best. They take up a ton of space in my closet. Like I'm slowly taking old stuff out of my closet and throwing it to the side and putting Roback in my closet, and I am totally fine with that. Uh, these these performance hoodies are so soft you will not be able to take them off. They also pair great with the Roback Performance joggers. They are made to move in and are incredibly comfortable. Some would say the best duo on the market, and I would not disagree. They also just restocked their new Performance Crew Next, and when I say they are soft, I mean it. Uh, they are made with Butterflex fabric. It is soft to the skin with stretch that allows you to move. Check out Roback. Use code TITUS at rhobac.com for 20% off your first purchase. That's R-H-O. 
B-A-C-K.com, 20% off all performance hoodies, crewnecks, joggers, and more with code Titus. Everything Roback makes is awesome. It is If you're someone that loves to work out and, and be comfortable in your clothes, Roback will get the job done. If you're someone that just wants to chill on the couch, Roback's great for that too. Uh, can't recommend their stuff enough. Code Titus, Roback.com. Do it now. Can I throw a name or rather an idea at you and you tell me if it's a non-ball knower take? Okay, go ahead. Steven Izzo is a senior at Michigan State. Yeah. Is there a chance this is the time Tom Izzo would oh, look yeah. at to leave or not leave, but be done? Be ha- hang it up. Um, I say no only in that, like, everybody's asked Izzo about this a million times and he keeps saying no. So I think, like, a lot of people have seen this, the writing on that wall and been like, Tom, you're probably over it. Cause, especially because, like, every time Tom Izzo does a press conference, it seems like he's like, I fucking hate the portal, dude. I hate NIL. Yeah. These kids these days, they just don't get it. And you're like, well, Tom, Sports you're passed us by. Yeah. You're going to retire then, right? He's like, hell no, never. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going anywhere. And the, <laughs> so I, I agree with you that it make if Tom Izzo did retire, I would not be shocked if not for the fact that he's been saying I'm not going anywhere. Right. So that would make it surprising. But the circumstances do check out there. Um, But other guys that could retire, uh, Laranega. At Miami, just made the Final Four. They're having a down year this year. Maybe he's like, eh, you know what? Last year's Final Four run is all I was really waiting on. We did it. I'll hang it up. Leonard Hamilton at Florida State. There are – those are two good jobs as well. So um, that's that's an interesting thing to monitor. Uh, some players to watch. Uh, talk about individual players here. So I've already kind of hit the uh, the cold-ass white boys. Um, I wrote down a lot of them um, here as well. But we'll, we'll just go through some of these players that I think are, are worth watching if you're – uh, haven't really been following along that much. Um, Zach Eady, National Player of the Year last year, is still at Purdue, is still Zach Eady. Uh, banked in a three against Indiana last week. Um, that was interesting. But otherwise, he, he pretty much does the exact same shit he did last year. Uh, for a lot of people, this is very frustrating and annoying and stupid. Uh, for Purdue fans, it is not. It is dominant. Um, he's putting up monster numbers. He's having a better year, I think, la- than he even did last year. Uh but, yeah, he's, he's the most inevitable force in college basketball. Every night he takes the floor, he will get a double-double. He will dominate the game. And um, whether he puts up insane numbers or not, the entire game will revolve around him on both ends of the floor. Uh, and and that's he's going to win National Player of the Year again. Uh, it's not even close. It won't even be close. It, it'll be uh, – it, it was over – basically in December of the National Player of the Year race, and he's he's only distanced his lead since then. So uh, he's certainly the face, if such a thing exists, of college basketball. We, we live at a time when people say there's no stars in college basketball. Zach Eady's about to win a back-to-back National Player of the Year, and he's going to do it unanimously. So there's him. Uh, R.J. Davis in North Carolina is a name that a lot of casual fans should know from the, the uh, takedown of Coach K's career. Uh, he was on that team. He was... The 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 co lead guard we'll say with Caleb Love. Um, last year Carolina started the season number one, had a very disappointing year, missed the NCAA tournament. Uh, Caleb Love transferred to Arizona, and Carolina you know filled in with some other guys. They have they have a decent team this year. Um, although like I've I've already mentioned they've been struggling lately, but R.J. Davis has been just unbelievable. He's 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 going to be a first team All American and deservedly so. He's uh. He, he's, he's scoring over 20 a game. I think it's like 21 maybe uh, a game. He, his, his efficiency numbers are great. He's shooting like 90-something percent from the free throw line. Um, he, he's the best player on Carolina, and uh, and it shows. And, and he's like a six-foot guard that I, I – I, he, he hasn't – he's had a couple not bad games, but like not as, not as awesome games recently, but he still like put up, I think he had like 25 against Miami. I, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but he just had another great game against Miami. So even like his, he, he's one of those dudes, like even his bad games aren't even really that bad. He's been, he's been pretty consistently great all season. Um, he's a guy to watch and a guy that, that you would be familiar with if you're a casual fan. Uh, speaking of Caleb Love, he's out at Arizona. Arizona has a good team. Uh, Caleb Love's a big reason why he, Maybe it's just because it's a change of scenery, but he, I do kind of trust him a little bit more this year. Um, but he's, at his core, the same guy. He's still the same guy that's like, you know what, fuck it, I'll shoot this. You know, I, I just thought about it. I'm just going to go ahead and shoot this. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, that's what you love about him, though. He's got he's got big balls. He makes big plays. Um, but, yeah, he's killing it out of Arizona. It was one of those breakups that worked great for both parties, I think. I think Carolina feels like a more – trustworthy team this year without Caleb Love, but I also think Caleb Love is thriving uh, in Tucson. So there's that. Dalton Connect we already talked about. 
Uh, Hunter Dickinson is at Kansas now. He transferred from Michigan. Um, he's he's so good. He, uh, he he's not as hateful, not as easy to be hated. I should say. Uh, he when he was at Michigan, he, it was like he was leaning into being the villain of college basketball. I think Bill Self got that out of him, um, and he's just he's just playing ball now. Uh, but yeah, he's he's in a lot of ways the same player, uh, just a, a, a seven footer who can hit that baby hook over his right shoulder. It's unstoppable. Uh, can step out and hit threes. Uh, great passer out of a double team. Still has limitations defensively and ball screen defense, and uh, you know he can be attacked in, in that regard. But uh, absolutely one of the best players in the country. Um, and so is Kevin McCuller, his teammate, the the do everything guy for for Kansas. Uh, who, who was brought to Kansas to be like a defensive stopper and then kind of became their their number one. Not even kind of, he did. He, he's like carrying their offense on the perimeter. Uh, Kevin McCuller's awesome. He's fun to watch. He's banged up right now, though. Um, Reed Shepard, I mentioned, at Kentucky. He's fun to watch. Tyler Kolick's fun to watch. Already mentioned him. Rob Dillingham at Kentucky is a guy I want to shout out because uh, Kentucky has two of their – uh, uh, Shepard and Dillingham are like Sidney Dean and, and Billy Hoyle off the bench for Kentucky. Uh, just the one-two punch of those guys is so fun. And Dillingham's a guy that uh, is is so bouncy, is so um, – he, he can pull it from anywhere, he can hit it from anywhere, but he's just so athletic and can get to the rim. And uh, he, there's, there's not a play that he can't make either. Him and Reed Shepard are so fun. When they're rolling, they are so fun to watch. But Dillingham can – he dropped 35 off the bench, I think, against Tennessee. I think he had 35. Uh, I need to pull that back out. I think it was against Tennessee. The Kentucky – Kentucky – I've got to pull this up again because I'm pretty sure Dillingham had 35. It was it was like an insane game that kind of went under the radar that he, he comes off the bench. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, Reed Shepard started the game. He had 16. Yeah, Dillingham had 35. He was <laughs> – in 27 minutes. He was 14 for 20 from the field against Tennessee, who, who is a great defensive team. Um, 35 points in 27 minutes off the bench. Uh, he's awesome, though. But special shout-out to him because he's a guy who played uh, at Donda Academy for Kanye West bullshit thing that he had set up out there in Southern California. The cult that, Don, that uh, Kanye created? Yeah. Did you, R- Rob Dillingham was out there. He was, like, a part of all that. And I remember when he committed to Kentucky, I was like, oh, boy, this fucking kid's going to – Boy, this is going to be a disaster that Kentucky's recruiting kids like this now. Because I didn't know anything about them. I was just like, if we're recruiting kids from Donda Academy, this is not going to go well. Yeah. But uh, to his credit, dude, Rob Dillingham has, has accepted his role. I was very wrong about the type of kid he must be if he's going to Donda Academy. Uh, swing and a miss by me because he's, he's awesome. He's fun to watch. Great dude and, and seems to, to really embrace his role off the bench, even though he probably should be starting. Um. Damask, we talked about. Cam Spencer, we talked about. Uh, Deron Holmes is a guy at Dayton. is like 6'10", 6'9", uh, puts the ball on the floor, can score, can rebound. He's a ton of fun to watch. Um, he's probably going to win A-10 player. Not even probably. He's, he's going to win A-10 player of the year. Uh, this Dayton team, uh, I, I think, is uh, – I don't know if special. They're not. They're not the 2020 Dayton team, but they are. They are very, very good and fun to watch. And, and he's a big reason why. So he's a guy. If you're looking for like a smaller school guy, but the real guy that, that TJ wants me to get to is Robbie Avila at uh, Indiana State. They just lost to Illinois State the other night. Yeah. Devastating. How bad is that for? I for them. I think they're still. I think they're still okay as as an at large. I think you can lose like one or two of those games. Um, I would still have them in. I think uh, I think the advanced metrics love them too. I think like the the Ken Palms of the world and the Evan Miyakawas of the world. I think they do st- still really like Indiana State because uh, their offense is awesome, dude. They're so fun to watch though. If you can catch Indiana State playing, or maybe I have that wrong. I don't know. I thought they. What? Are, let me see here. I think they're forty sixth on Ken Palm. They're twenty two and four. Um. The problem is like when they lose, like they lost the other night at home by thirteen. I think it's less that they lost to Illinois State, and it's, it's that they lost by thirteen. Uh, that's pretty bad. And they lost to they lost to Bama by twenty two. Uh, but yeah, they they their offense is so fun to watch, and and Avila is like the the Jokic of mid major college basketball. He's just like a, I say this affectionately. He's just kind of like a sloppy doughy big dude that can pass and shoot and put the ball in the he, he can make all the plays he's just it's kind of like watching a worse version of Jokic um he's awesome and I, I I still think the Indiana State team is going to the Sweet 16 I have him in my Sweet 16 and the bracket's not even out but uh 
yeah, those are some guys to watch that I wrote down that uh, I think people would be fired up about. Um, next section I wanted to do real quick was the blue blood update because I think people, when you tune into college basketball, you're just like, how good are the – tell me tell me about this Duke team. Is, is Duke good? Is Kentucky good? Is whatever else. So I'll do a quick uh, rundown of all the blue bloods so you know where they stand. Um, North Carolina is uh, – not as good as a good North Carolina team is, but I still think they're – I don't know. The, recently, it's – if you would have asked me this two weeks ago, I don't even know who I'm talking to. Nobody even asked me today. This is just me talking to myself on this show. But if you, if you would have uh, – if this topic would have come up two weeks ago, I would have said that Carolina is very much in the national title mix. They, they then lose to Georgia Tech by one. They lose at home to Clemson by four. And then they just kind of – not got dominated, but like Syracuse kind of had their way with them at, at Syracuse uh, for most of that game. And uh, I, yeah, I don't know. It was back and forth, I guess, a little bit. But Syracuse, Syracuse wins by seven. And um, I, I'm I'm scratching my head a little bit more about Carolina. The defense isn't been hasn't been as good as it was when they were really rolling. Uh, the ACC is down, so I wonder how much of that when. When Carolina is seven and three coming out of the loss against Kentucky, they they lost to UConn and Kentucky back to back on neutral floor. Um, also lost to Villanova, who's not very good anymore uh, in overtime earlier in the year. But they're seven and three coming out of the Kentucky game, and then they rip off ten straight wins, a lot of road wins in conference play, which should not be taken for granted. But um, you know, you you, you do kind of wonder how how much those matter if. None of the teams in the ACC are all that great, but I don't think the ACC is that bad either. I think the ACC just has a lot of like B B minus teams, um, and Carolina was pasting all of them, and they were playing really well. And they lose to Georgia Tech by one. Uh, if I remember right, there was like a controversial no call at the end of that game where R.J. Davis should have gone to the free throw line, and he's a 91% free throw shooter. You probably would have hit them both, and they probably would have won by one. Uh, so then they turn around, they beat Duke pretty easily at home. That was not that competitive of a game. Um, and so it's hard to fully make sense of how good Carolina is. They are still, I would not be shocked if Carolina made the final four. I wouldn't be, I, I think they are good enough to win a national championship. Uh, but there are starting to be some cracks in the dam. And there was, when they lost to Clemson, there were reports of like, not turmoil in the locker room, but there was discussion the 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 players kept talking about how guys were late to shoot around and guys do, you know are don't have the right mindset and all that sort of thing which is not something you want to hear uh in february of a college basketball season so i i, I north carolina is kind of at a crossroads right now they have they're still in first place in the acc i still like the rj davis is there uh, we talked about him armando baycott is still there uh elliot Cadeau is a freshman all-american point guard um Who's not like he's not like on the Kobe White level of of freshman point guards for for North Carolina, but he's he's been pretty solid for them this year. Harrison Ingram is like the I don't know I'm I'm I, I hate using I I don't want to compare him to like I don't I don't like comparing college basketball players to like NBA All Stars. That's not a fair thing to do, but I'm trying to make it easy for people to understand who I'm talking about. Saint Robbie Avila is Jokic. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty fucking ridiculous, right. but I'm trying to give people an example of like what you could just vibes shades of we'll say um Harrison Ingram has that like Draymond mentality where he's just kind of does a little bit of like Draymond at his peak I don't mean like the Draymond that kicks people in the dick and gets tossed from games I mean like the guy who can like play defense can knock down I guess Draymond's not a great shooter bad example I'm gonna walk this back um he brings a little edge to him he's he's the x factor of of Carolina Harrison Ingram from uh they got him from Stanford. Cormac Ryan came over from Notre Dame. He's a knockdown shooter. Uh, there's there's a lot to love about this Carolina team. I think they're one of the best teams in the country. But Carolina fans are a little wishy washy on them because uh, they're used to they're used to you know like when when they see a national title contender they know it. And I I feel like there's a sense in Chapel Hill. It's like this team's okay. This team's not great. So that that's the Carolina part. Uh, the Duke part. All the talent in the world. Great, great freshman class. Kyle Filipowski is back uh, in it for his sophomore year. Could have gone in the first round, probably in the draft last year. Uh, is is maybe going to be a first team All American. Um, it has been has been really really good for Duke. I think Duke is soft. I think Duke. Uh, my problem with this Duke team is that they don't have an identity. I think Duke is uh, good enough on paper to win a national championship. I think their problem is that they're just kind of out there playing basketball. And I don't want to rip John Shire too much for that, but there does seem to be a lack of a culture around Duke basketball 
since Coach K left. And uh, I, I find that a little interesting. Um, but, yeah, they, they're, it's still a Duke team full of talent. And it's still guys that, uh, you know, if, if you go to, like, the sports reference page five years from now, there will be a lot of NBA logos next to these players that are playing for Duke currently. Um, I just – I don't think this Duke team's special by Duke standards either. But they also are a half game back of North Carolina in the ACC standings. They still get Carolina at home in the season. They could – very easily win the conference. Uh, they could win the ACC tournament. They're going to be like a four seed, five seed. If things go well, they could be a three seed in the NCAA tournament. Um, there's very much a, a world in which Duke has a successful season and wins some trophies and, and goes to a Sweet 16, Elite Eight, hell, maybe a Final Four. I just I don't feel like this Duke team has the mental toughness to win six straight NCAA tournament games. Uh, it, it just they, they don't they don't when you watch Duke play they don't impose their will on the other team they don't have they're just they play very reactionary basketball they they wait for the terms to be dictated of what the game will be and then they play based on those terms and to me that's not the mark of a national champion but having said all that they are very loaded with talent so uh, that's Duke Kentucky is um K- the Kentucky report is that they. I was very high on them coming into the year. Very guard dominant team. Um, they have big dudes that that can play a little bit. They play zero defense. They have no idea what they're doing defensively. It is it is shocking to watch at times. They can it, they are at their best when they are not thinking. They are as a team just getting up and down and and putting a, and just trying to play a track meet type game of basketball um, with Dillingham and DJ Wagner and Antonio Reeves and and Reed Shepard and. Just on down the line, they – I don't know. To me, this was a vintage Cal team where they he has – they have four guards in Wagner, Reeves, uh, Shepard, and Dillingham. They have four, like, guards that you could give the ball to and say, our offense is fucked, please save us. And all four of those guys can make something out of nothing. And in a sport where in March, that's kind of the number one thing I look to is I looked at, I look at like – you know your your team is great. You've won a lot of games, but when things go south, do you have a guy that can just save the day for you? And um, Kentucky has four of them, and for that reason alone, I feel like it's kind of a no brainer that they should be in the hunt for a national title. The lack of defense, the the um, the lack of understanding from John Calipari of like which guys he likes and doesn't, and trying to figure out lineups. I Kentucky fans are like pulling their hair out trying to make sense of what the fuck is going on with this team because uh, this feels like for Kentucky to be down the last few years it feels like it this was primed to be a season where Kentucky was very much back these guys all seem to like each other um, they have a ton of talent like I keep saying over and over uh, there's really no reason that you know the expectation you want to pretend like at all these schools all these blue bloods it is national championship or bust that's not realistic it's just just not and with the way the NCAA tournament works you you can't expect to win a national championship every year um but there was very much an expectation that Kentucky would have a return to form for the program this year and so far they are squandering that the first time uh they've they've ever lost I, I said earlier first time they've ever lost in program history three in a row uh in Rupp Arena they just beat Ole Miss at home by 12 so that streak has been snapped but still um you know they they have shown when when Kentucky has shown the flashes they have looked like a national title team but again can they do it six times in a row when the tournament rolls around I I don't know anymore I don't know anymore that they they of all the blue bloods they were the team that I loved the most and uh, I've I've fallen out of love with them and then finally Kansas uh, of the Big Four Kansas uh, I don't like Kansas uh, Kansas is is was the preseason number one team in the country. They have, uh, they are very top heavy on their roster. Um, I mean, Kevin McCuller not playing against Texas Tech and them losing by 29 makes the most sense in the world to me. Like they are a team that need, they need KJ Adams, Kevin McCuller, Hunter Dickinson, and Dewan Harris. All four of those guys to play like, like if it's a meaningful game, all four of those guys kind of can't come out of the game. They all four have to play. 40 minutes, uh, and that's. I'm worried Kansas is going to run out of gas once the tournament rolls around. All four of those guys are they, they might have the best starting the most talented starting five in college basketball. Their bench is non existent. They have nothing on the bench. Um so that's that's where we're at with Kansas. They have two guys in Dickinson and Kevin McCuller who could be first team all Americans. They they legitimately could get two for two guys on the first team all American team. And I also expect absolutely nothing from them in the NCAA tournament. Having said all that, Bill Self 
always seems to find a way um, to to win a game or two. So uh, I don't I don't think Kansas is bad by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but they're just so top heavy that the, the idea of them winning a national championship doesn't doesn't compute in my mind. Not not this Kansas team, which might be a little, excuse me might be a little surprising because they uh, they were the preseason number one team. Um, what else? I I wrote down uh, some recent NCAA tournament darling updates because that happens sometimes. Like fans fall in love with like some of these programs that go on NCAA tournament runs. So just quick update: San Diego State last year goes to the Final Four. Uh, they are nineteen and six currently this year. They're second in the Mountain West. Uh, Jaden Ledee, uh, the, a big guy. He's like a big bruising. Uh, you know, looks like a guy that's going to be a tight end in the NFL or like a professional wrestler or something when he's done playing fo- uh, done playing basketball. Um, he's putting up monster numbers, most improved player in the country, and I don't think it's particularly close. 20 points a game, eight and a half rebounds. He's shooting 39% from the three-point line, and heading into this year, the first three seasons of his career, he was 0 for 16 combined from the three-point line, and now he's shooting 39% from the three-point line. Um, they lost they lost Mensa, they lost Bradley, they lost Kishad, uh, Kishad Johnson. Um, all those guys are gone, but Darian Trammell is back. Lamont Butler, the guy who hit the shot against uh, Florida Atlantic in the Final Four, he is back. Micah Parrish is back. So if you watch San Diego State, you watched the Final Four last year, you'll recognize a lot of faces, but the one thing you won't recognize is Jaden Ledee's their best player. He was on the team last year. And he came off the he you know he was he was okay for them last year, um, but he he's a monster this year. FAU brought all five starters back, and they brought Dusty May back, who I don't expect to be back next year. Uh, he and 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 it felt like FAU, they're heading into the season. It felt like they might be on undefeated watch, um, which is an insane thing to say about any college basketball team. But like if it, it felt like if I had to pick one team that was going to start the season like twenty five and zero, it probably would have been FAU. Uh, but then they lost their third game at home to Bryant, and that's kind of been they, – they kind of have been going through the motions a little bit. Like, they, they still are a good team. Um, they, they they still have, you know, decent wins, and, and they, they show up every so often. But, uh, I mean, just last weekend they, they got taken to overtime by Wichita State, and Wichita State is not good whatsoever. And that, that seems to continue to be the thing with Florida Atlanta. It just feels like – they lost to Bryant. They did beat Arizona in double overtime right before Christmas, but they lost it to, uh, to Florida Gulf Coast. They lost to Charlotte. They lost to UAB. They, they're losing to teams that they should not in any. They, it should not even be close. And uh, and they're like they lost to Bryant by nine at home. Bryant stinks. So Fl- Florida Atlantic is still a team that you have to you have to take seriously uh, when the tournament rolls around. But also, it, if Florida Atlantic last year against Memphis in the NCAA tournament when uh, they almost lost, and, and Memphis fans will tell you they should have lost, had they lost in the first round and then turned around and had the season that they're having right now, there's not a single person, I think, that would have Florida Atlantic on their radar as like a Final Four caliber team this year. They, they're, they're not, they don't look the part of a Final Four team other than they beat Arizona. Which Arizona's a very good team. Um, but they're kind of going through the motion. So I think the hope uh, in Boca Raton is that when the tournament rolls around, they're going to flip the switch. It's just, I don't know if it always works that way. Uh, fairly Dickinson, um, beat Purdue obviously last year, their coach went to Iona. Uh, they're 11 and 14 this year. Fairly Dickinson is, and they're tied fourth in the league. It'll take a miracle for them to make the NCAA tournament. So, um, you know, that's, and as a reminder, fairly Dickinson, TJ, maybe you remember this, did not even win their conference tournament last year. They right. lost to Merrimack. But Mary Mack wasn't eligible. The to fighting Fasolis. Yes. The fighting Fasolis. Yeah, their head coach on this show. People forget. That's right. That's right. Um, so fairly Dickinson probably not going to be uh, in the mix this year. Um, and Iona, uh, Tobin Anderson's at Iona now, and he's twelve and eleven this year. They're okay. Not having a bad year. Not having a great year. Um, they could theoretically put it together and win their conference tourney. Uh, they'd probably be like a 16 seed, though, if they did. So that's, But that would be interesting. He's been a 16 seed before and had some success. Um, what else? St. Peter's from a couple years ago. Shaheen Holloway's at Seton Hall now. Uh, they're third in the Big East. They beat UConn at home by 15 as the last time UConn lost. They also beat Marquette at home. I'm talking about uh, Seton Hall, not St. Peter's. Uh, St. Peter's did not make the tournament last year. They lost in the conference semis. Um they're eleven and eleven this year. They're not going to make the tourney again. So sad to say, but St. Peter's is uh, probably not going to be in the mix. If if you're someone who you know fell in love with that St. Peter's program, is Doug Eater still in college basketball? Uh, he was at Bryant. Yeah. I don't know where he is now. Is is Doug Eater still in college basketball? Is a great question. Doug Eater, yeah, he is. He's at Bryant still. That's crazy. 
Yeah, he was on the team that beat Florida Atlantic. He's only averaging five a game though, Bryant. He doesn't. He doesn't even start for him. Well, yeah, so. I mean, he was like the star of that run, but he was also like the fourth or fifth best player on that. Yeah. Team. Yeah, but he had like a mustache. But he has a mustache, yeah. right. He was a funny guy with a mustache. Uh, and then lastly, I guess, Loyola Chicago, quick update is that... Uh, Sister Jean? Sister Jean. As, as of this recording... <laughs> okay. <laughs> knock on wood. Sister Jean is still alive, still going to games, uh, still... And, and by the way, Loyola Chicago, sneakily under the radar, having a great season. They're they're tied for first with Dayton in the A-10 right now, at 10-2. and two. They started six and five, had some bad losses, did not look particularly competitive in the Barstool Invitational to start the season, um, but they're twelve and two since starting six and five, and uh, Drew Valentine is their head coach. Denzel Valentine's his brother who played at Michigan State. There's that little factoid, but yeah, there's Loyola Chicago. <laughs> Quick break to talk about our friends at Visible. Draining a half-court buzzer beater to win the game, not easy. Switch into Visible and saving on wireless with no hidden fees. Yeah, that is pretty easy. Switch to Visible, the wireless company with nothing to hide, and get one-line wireless with unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon, just $25 a month, every month, taxes and fees included. It is one-line wireless. It is just $25 a month, taxes and fees included in that. No hidden fees, no gotchas, no anything else. Just $25 a month. Everything's included in it. V- v- Visible is the wireless company with absolutely nothing to hide. Unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon. Bench wireless with hidden fees and switch to Visible. Rate with service on the Visible plan for additional terms and network management practice- practices. See Visible.com. <laughs> Uh, the Mountain West is another fun surprise. The Mountain West has been very fun this year. A lot of really good basketball being played in the Mountain West. And as of right now, Utah State is at the top of the standings at nine and three. San Diego State's eight and four. New Mexico's eight and four. Boise State's seven and four. UNLV seven and four. Colorado State's seven and five. Nevada six, six and five. All of those teams, I still think could win the conference. I think all of those, like Nevada, is nineteen and six on the year. I think if I remember right, it was the only conference that entered or that in non-conference play had every single team have a winning record um, as they entered conference play. So the Mountain West has been a fun surprise. Uh, I know that, that uh, yeah, there was there was the narrative that the Mountain West can't win in the NCAA tournament, but San Diego State made the Final Four last year, so maybe we could throw that out. South Carolina is another fun surprise. Uh, just lost by literally 40 at Auburn. That's not great. Um, but Michi Johnson and B.J. Mack are a ton of fun. Lamont Paris is the head coach there, and he's he's been great. But I also worry for South Carolina fans that his name's going to be floated around for a lot of these jobs that'll open. Nebraska is another one. Uh, Nebraska basketball has been on fire, but they've also they're also basically only winning at home, which is a little concerning. Uh, but they're on the bubble, and yeah, we we live in a time where Nebraska and Northwestern, uh, two programs that were famous forever for never making the NCAA tournament, never winning a game in the NCAA tournament, um, are now like two of the better teams in the, in the Big Ten, which speaks to how bad the Big Ten is. Uh, what else? Maybe I'll do this last, and then uh. Yeah, we can we can wrap this up. I, I would do I would do the uh, tier expectations like this. So, this is a, a nice concise way to uh to tier all the teams. I think the national title or bust tier. I think it is a two. There are two teams at the top, and then there's a little bit of a gap. And the two teams are UConn and Purdue. I think those are the two teams that at this point in the season are saying if we don't win the national championship, we are going to see this as a very disappointing season. Now. There is the caveat to Purdue that they have not made a Final Four since 1980. They have had a lot of heartbreak in the NCAA tournament recently. If Purdue does go to a Final Four, if Purdue does go to a national championship and lose, I do imagine there will be some part of the, the fan base that's like, hell of a year. It's so great to be back on, on on the biggest stage, all that sort of thing. But in a vacuum, for the talent they have, for how good they've been this year, uh, every single person in that Purdue locker room is saying, we not only are good enough to win a national championship, we expect to win the national championship. The same is being said at UConn, who, by the way, this UConn team, number one in the country, defending national champion. Uh, it's funny because I, I don't think this UConn team is as good as last year, and yet at this point in the season, this UConn team is way more dominant than last year's team was at this point in the season, if that makes any sense. Um, so it's a, it's a weird – it's a weird – yeah, th- I, f- I feel like those two facts are are – both individually true but they kind of don't seem to make sense when you put them next to each other but uh yeah UConn is UConn has just been it, it's it's just routine for them at this point they just uh yeah they, they they are very deserving of their number one ranking and I think Purdue's up there too I think the final four are bust here um now that I'm looking at it I'm second guessing myself I think Houston is definitely in the final four bust here 
I think Tennessee, I think Arizona, I think Marquette, and I do think North Carolina, even though North Carolina has been struggling as of late. I, I think all of those teams should expect to make the Final Four. Obviously, they all won't. That would absolutely be a record if that many teams made the Final Four. Uh, so, But th- that's that's how I would tier it. I think all of those teams should have the mentality of, like, if we don't make the Final Four, this was a failure of a season. Um, the next tier, I would say good enough to make the Final Four, but probably won't. Uh, which is to say, like, I'm not going to be shocked if they do, but also I'm, I'm when the bracket comes out, I'm certainly not counting on any of these teams to, to make the Final Four. Uh, Kansas is at the top of that list for reasons I mentioned earlier. Illinois is a team that has shown flashes of, of greatness, but then you kind of look, you kind of pick apart their resume, and it's like, who are they really beating that is super elite? Um, and that, that worries me a little bit. Auburn, we talked about earlier, is like dominant at home. And you, you start drinking the Kool-Aid when you watch them at home, but then, you know, you really take a hard look at them outside of home, and you're like, I don't. That doesn't look like a. That doesn't look like a Final Four team, does it? Uh, Baylor's another team that doesn't play good enough defense, but but they can they they can get red hot on offense um, and beat anybody. And then Iowa State's kind of the inverse. They play incredible defense, uh, balanced scoring from Iowa State. Uh, Otzelberger's a great coach. I like Iowa State's program. I think they are theoretically good enough to make a Final Four. I don't expect them to be able to string four games together to get there. Uh, next here, high ceiling but way too low of a floor. Um, I, I wrote the, the four for me there are Kentucky, Duke, Bama, and Wisconsin. I think you catch them on the right night, any of those four teams, they look like the best team in the country. Uh, Wisconsin's been fading a little bit as of late. Um, but, yeah, in Kentucky, obviously, I talked about the three-game losing streak. Bama, when they're hitting threes, man, they do look unstoppable. They look like a team that could score 140 in a game. Um, and and Duke has all the talent in the world, but uh, I I just I think their floor is too low. I think all four of those floors for like all four of those teams can can also look not great, and uh, that worries me. And then I wrote down um, good enough good enough to ruin other teams' final four runs, but don't think they're good enough to go on their own final four run, which is kind of <laughs> good enough to make the final four, but probably won't. It's kind of the same thing. And it's uh, I put Michigan State and Creighton in their own tier. BYU should probably be mentioned somewhere in here. I'm putting BYU at uh, good enough to make the Final Four, but probably won't. Their offense is fun, dude. They play a five out offense, shoot a ton of threes. Mark Pope is a great coach. Um, they theoretically can make the Final Four, but I don't expect them to. But yeah, Michigan State and Creighton are two teams that can. They have a ton of experience. They brought a ton of guys back. Both 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 teams brought a ton of guys back from last year. Uh, who, who, you know, Creighton goes to the Elite Eight. Um, and uh, Michigan State, I, they lost in the Sweet 16, right, to Kansas State? or they, Yeah, they lost in the Sweet 16, if I remember right. they lose in the, Yeah, they lost in the Sweet 16 to Kansas State. I have that right. At, at Tell me I'm right, TJ. Were you there for that game? Tell me I'm right. Uh, um, but, yeah, both of those – both of those teams have a lot of NCAA tournament experience, so I would not be shocked – if they pull off big upsets and maybe they do it twice, but I don't actually think that they're going to go to the final four. You're right. It was sweet 16. And then yeah. Kansas state I lost to, uh, um, Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic. That's right. Yeah. Did you go a, to one of, one of those games? No, e, that was MSG, right? Yeah. I think it, that I was Marquise it, Noel. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I went to the first one. I went to the FAU. Um, who'd they beat Mark? No, I went to the, what game did I go FAU to? FAU beat Tennessee. I went to the FAU Tennessee game, I think. Or no, I went to the Michigan State. I went to the Michigan State Kansas State game. They played yeah, Marquette I did. Also. I don't know, dude. I'm I'm losing it. <laughs> I'm losing it. Never get old, dude. You just it all starts bleeding together. Um, all right. I think that might be it. I don't know. I covered a lot. I feel like I covered a lot. That was spitting. That was. That I was feel real, like real ball knowledge, dude. I was just deployed. fucking rolling there for a second. Um, can I rucker to you for five seconds? Go ahead. Uh, I think Jeremiah Williams might be the best player in the Big Ten, and he didn't get to start playing until three weeks ago. Rutgers is going to break my heart in a different break, way. Break this, your heart in a different year. way this year, <laughs> where they're going to play their way onto the wrong side of the bubble. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to play their way into like second four out. They're going to play next four out. Yeah, their way into oh shucks, just not yeah. quite enough down the stretch. So <laughs> NIT still slide back in the DMs. <laughs> yeah. Let me know who to watch out for this year, but. They've been sick as fuck. They've destroyed Wisconsin, which is not saying much. But if if the I said I bought in on Twitter, if they win tonight, as you've already listened to this, 
then I'm actually bummed. Yeah. All right. Northwestern. You got Northwestern at home? Home. And yeah. then at Minnesota, at Purdue. Who's a, what's a road win that Rutgers has recently? That's that's a good uh, indicator. Uh, Maryland. All right. Yeah. You Went know. Down by 20 to Michigan, came back and won that. Yeah. Which that's, they, that says nothing because they suck ass, but that was the first. Yeah. They're, they're going to make me, oh, fuck, you're going to make me believe. Dude, Minnesota, so the next game, I, I don't want to keep, like, moving the goalposts. And no, say, no, 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 no. Yeah. But uh, we have a it, long, the goalpost is very far away. I will say that the minute you're going to lose at Purdue, prob- probably, maybe not. Um, You do have a history of beating Purdue. We got to Min- win, like, at least one of those road games. Minnesota is a sentence. big one. I, I, So if they beat Northwestern at home, you're back, you're fully back in. If you yes. guys beat Minnesota, Minnesota's good this year. Yeah. And if you went, well, good for. Sneaking the, out ass. If you beat Minnesota in, at Minnesota, I'll be back in. I'm, I'm, I'll start pushing the Rutgers propaganda. The, the, the agenda writers in, in New Jersey say that the goalposts right now are win the next game because yeah. if we look too far ahead, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's true. I'm, that's true. I, I am ble- he's Jeremiah Williams, he came off eligibility issues. Big Ten Player of the Week right away. It's incredible. Crazy. It's incredible. You guys have the funniest uh, – I, I saw a lot of people passing this around. Um, was it the Michigan game that uh, the Ken Palm screenshot of Rutgers that you had like the number one or two or three? Yeah, I think in the, country in the last like 300 three, something yeah, was in the last offense. three games. We have like the number one adjusted defensive efficiency and the number 299 adjusted <laughs> offensive efficiency, which just means that we're like an extremely frustrating team to play against that yeah. usually loses. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, Oh, I, I had this other set. Well, screw it. Let's just go. Let's just do it. Uh, things we're wait. I things that that we as a college basketball community are waiting to see before Selection Sunday. So, uh, as the run up to March Madness, the reason to watch college basketball until uh, Selection Sunday comes in four weeks are are the following. Um, the two other number one seeds. I think UConn and Purdue are locks, barring catastrophe. They could lose one, two, three, maybe games, four games. Hell, you know, like they they are so far in my mind, above the rest of the field, that they, they have a very big margin of error, both of those teams. Um, they're almost certainly locks to be number one seeds. Houston is probable. Uh, Houston's in a really good spot to be a one seed, and I, I expect them to be. Um, so, but, you know, a lot of things can happen, and, and the Big 12 is probably the most difficult conference in college basketball. So, you know, maybe maybe they falter down the stretch. But Houston's in a, in a pretty good spot. The fourth is very much up for grabs. Um, how much does the number one seed matter uh, in, in modern college basketball? I don't know. It's still, you know, like historically mo- more number one seeds win national titles and, you know, like it, the seeding does fl- flesh out in that way like you would expect it to. Um, so I – but, but you know, the last few years it's it, it feels like the, the parity being what it is, like, you know, does it really matter if you're the last number one or if you're a number two or a three or – UConn was the number four last year, and they dominated the NCAA tournament every single game they played. So um, I'm not sure how much it actually matters, but that's something that's uh, you know it matters for programs to 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 puff their chest, and it matters in recruiting, and it matters in, in that sort of thing. It's like a small little uh, win, and it also matters because you're now the program that has to clinch your asshole when you're playing the 16 seed, and you're not you know you hope that you're not the one that loses to the 16 this year. Um, but yeah, the fourth number one is very much up for grabs. It's probably Arizona right now, if I had to, if I had to guess. But Marquette could be in the mix. Um, yeah, there's there's there are a lot of there are a lot of teams that could uh, be in that mix. The other thing is, I, I I do feel like Zach Eady is the only lock to make the All American team right now. Um, it's pretty wide open who's going to make it. Uh, some guys are are better than others, obviously. Uh, but I I I, th- I think there's. I think another lock is going to be one of the guys from Kansas, but I don't know who it will be, and I find that interesting. I think I think Kansas will have one guy be on the first team All American team. I just don't know if it's going to be Hunter Dickinson or Kevin McCuller, and uh, maybe it'll end up being both. But I I, I I think that that's an interesting wrinkle. So if you know the All American team is is not even close to being fully fleshed out yet, and some years it is by now. Some years it's like these three or you know three or four guys are way better than everybody else. This year, I I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I I have my guys that I like more than everyone than some others, but uh, not everybody sees it the way I do. Um, I think who wins the SEC is another thing that I'm going to be monitoring. I I'm fascinated by the SEC regular season race. Uh, I'm fascinated by if Houston can hang on to to win the Big Twelve in year one. This is their first year stepping up conference, and right now they're at the top of the best conference in college basketball, and that would certainly be noteworthy if big if Houston steps into 
steps into the Big 12 that has been dominated by Kansas, who has won 17 of the last 19, I think, is the stat. 17 of the last 19 Big 12 championships have been Kansas has won a share of. Um, if Houston can step in in year one and, and win the Big 12 outright, that would be that would be huge for uh, the perception of Houston basketball. And then uh, I guess coach firings is the other thing we're waiting to Selection Sunday. Or there's going to be another program other than Ohio State that gets anxious and wants to fire their coach before the season ends because they want to get a head start on on hiring all these guys. So uh, those are some of the things. I don't know. I feel like I'm out of thoughts now. That was that was a brain dump for me. And hopefully if you haven't really been following college basketball, you now have a good starting point to turn on some games and let it ride from there. <laughs> All right, quick break to talk about our friends at All Athlete. Uh, I am working on my vertical jump still. The free throw stream that we did uh, did a did a number on my shins, and I'm trying to work through that. Um, I I gotta I gotta get my hips and my knees and my had a little shin splint situation going on. We were doing that uh that 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 march to the 41 free throws. But we are back on the we are back in the saddle. I am back trying to dunk a basketball in 2024. That was my New Year's resolution. It's been a few years since I've dunked. All Athlete is going to help me do that. My friend Greg has an incredible new feature on All Athlete app that allows you to measure your height, your wingspan, your vertical jump, and 20-plus other measurements just by using your iPhone Pro. I did my vertical jump uh, a little while ago. It was 22 inches. Um, I think I'm going to have to start doing some other tests because i got to figure that out. i gotta, I got to see if the vertical's gone up because – uh, I have not been, if I'm being completely honest, I've not been sticking to the plan as much as I need to be. And it's time to get my ass in gear because I do want to dunk a basketball. I want to do it before the national championship. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'm going to do it at the national championship after it's played. I'm just going out, going, going to go out on the court and dunk. Uh, be that as it may, if you think you can beat my vertical jump, download the all athlete app today and give it a try the person with the highest vertical jump will win a 100 dollars amazon gift card all you have to do is download the app screenshot your your vertical jump post it to twitter with the hashtag titus jump and tag at all athlete inc that's it download the app all you have to do just jump up in the air the, the app does all the work it'll measure it for you um you post it to twitter hashtag titus jump Tag at All Athlete Inc. and you can win a hundred dollar gift card if you can beat my job. But I don't know, twenty two inches is is pretty ridiculous. That's that might be a record. So uh, we will see. Think you can beat my vertical jump? Download All Athlete app for a chance to win a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Go do it now. Uh, great app, and uh, yeah, I don't think you can beat me. I dare you. I dare you to do it. Go. It's, so. it's one of my favorite times of the year. Low key is this spot right now when college basketball, especially on Saturdays, yeah. takes the forefront, gets the, all the TVs at the bar. There's great games yep. this weekend. Um, I, I become way time. more popular around <laughs> my place of employment around this time yeah. of year. Yeah, it's well, that and hitting a bunch of free throws. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, dude. I guess let's talk about that real quick. That's, that's that'll be part of the shout outs. We'll wrap this up. I promise. I'm done with the the college basketball preview. Now let's get to the self suck uh, <laughs> part of the show. Um, shout out to to basically everybody that was involved in that. That was one of the I I told Dave and Dan. And I know we're we're well removed from it, and we've talked about it on like every single barstool show that exists by now. But uh, whatever, we're here now, and you brought it up. Um, I that was like the coolest. I told I told Dave this, like uh, other than when we we clinched the final four. I'd have to think about it. I think other than like when we beat Memphis to go to the final four, I don't remember a feeling in my life as triumphant as that. As like. I guess my senior night was pretty awesome. We we won the Big Ten and everyone rushed the floor, but, um, but we expected to win that. Like I like the 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 feeling when Dave made shot number forty one. I I've done some cool shit. It's never not not because of me. I've just been along for the ride for all the stuff. But like all the stuff that I've done in my life and the teams that I've been lucky enough to be on, that seriously, all jokes aside, was like one of the coolest triumphant team moments I've ever experienced in my life and I was like just so overwhelmed with like I cannot believe we did I literally thought it was impossible now bringing in the ringers did kind of tweak things like once once I saw Scott from New Hampshire Scott Morris from New Hampshire fucking sniper that guy is once I saw him you know it was funny because like when he walked into the gym I actually didn't even watch him shoot I watched how he was walking and then I, I, someone threw him a ball, and he dribbled it one time, not even like between his legs or anything. He just like went to the like went to the three point line or the free throw line or something, 
just did like one dribble and I was like, oh, we're good. And I just turned around and kept shooting free throws because I, I could just tell the way he – I could just tell the guy could shoot by how he was walking, honestly. Um, once we added him to the mix, it became obviously less impossible. Uh, but I spent – of those 16 hours, I spent 14 hours believing that this is this is literally impossible and I'm just going to keep stepping up and doing what I can. But eventually Dave's going to have to wave the white flag on this. And for us to actually do it uh, – I don't know. It was it was one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. So um, that was awesome. And it is really funny that like m- the respect that my coworkers and stoolies have for me has like gone through the roof. Like people are like, "Damn, dude, I wasn't sure about you," but now, and it's funny to me because I'm like, if there's one thing you shouldn't ever doubt about me is that I can shoot a fucking basketball right. now. I was like, <laughs> it's kind of like your thing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's the. <laughs> but like, it's it's funny because like Dave's like. Not, I, I don't think it should have ever been called into question, but it's like my, it's it's like there was some doubt about how bought in I was right. with Barstool still right, or something, right, right. and it's like now we've removed all doubt, and I was like, I, this should not have been the thing that removed the doubt. Like yeah. I was shooting a basketball, I've done this my whole life, I've <laughs> never for sixteen hours, but like this right. was this was very, I would say eighty five percent of the time I was having a blast, even at like three a.m. I was, this was my entire life. Like I, I uh. I didn't have a ton of friends in high school. I didn't have a ton of, like, I, I really was the the same way you listen to, like, gu- guitar players when they talk about, like, how they lock themselves in their room and just play guitar, and that's how they got good at it and shit. Um, I, I wasn't a great basketball player, but one thing I did do, my whole childhood was, like, I was outside with a basketball in an empty, or I was in an empty gym with a basketball just putting shots up. So all that feeling of just, like, standing at a free throw line shooting a basketball, that was just, that's this is something I've done literally my whole life by myself. Um... And so it was funny because, like, I was getting patted on the back for, like, being a hero. And I was like, I had a great time, dude. Like, this was not <laughs> – this was, like, something I've always yeah. done. If anybody um, – you pissed your pants on camera, like, yeah, four I know. months ago. I was, that, I was, that was a buy-in I was like, that moment. was the one – that was the buy-in <laughs> moment, dude. <laughs> like, you're, you're – yeah, I don't know. So that, that part of it yeah. was pretty funny to me. But Kirk uh, Kirk killed it, too, and Shay. I mean, I've – I've we, we've talked about yeah. it on Mostly Sports a bunch. From, now, a, from a viewer standpoint, being around the product for so long, it's like it was one of those things where I was like, if they do this, like we're watching an all-time Barstool moment like, yeah. in like in the making right now. I, I keep doubting that these After Dark streams are possible and they keep getting accomplished, but it was like this was a special one, I think, because it was like it was a team. Like the amount yeah. of people on that shirt, Everybody played some sort of role, even Brandon removing himself from the situation entirely to go sleep. That helped. It like, really did. It really yeah. did. It helped. It, to have that many people come together to do something, I thought it was super, super cool to watch. And I think people I, like doubted the idea at first, but I'm glad that Yeah, that it's funny because if you just watch the final run, Kirk didn't shoot a single shot, and I think Kirk was a co-MVP. Yeah. I think he. I think Kirk and I were the, were, were the two guys that carried it, and we – um, you know, in the end, we weren't. Even, I wasn't even the best shooter. Like it came, it came time for like the final set of like eight free throws before Dan and Dave stepped up, and uh, everybody turned to me, and I was like, "Dude, Scott's the guy." Like I'm, I'm, I'm running on fumes. I was running on fumes six hours ago. Right. Like have that guy shoot him. So I only shot five on the final run, and I shot five early ones, and then Kirk didn't even shoot at all. He had removed himself, but like for Kirk to do that, honestly, was incredible because he was. He was carrying the whole th- like he and I were carrying everything through the wee hours of the night, and then when it came time to actually do it, Kirk like identified that maybe you don't need me. I'm gonna step aside. Um, yeah. So to your point, like everybody played a part, even if only seven of us eventually were the ones that that did the 41. It was so cool. It really was. It was like less of a free throw thing and more of like a psychology and like yeah. camaraderie and just like the the inner workings of guys being dudes basically yeah it was just like <laughs> it's very very cool to watch like the 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 celebration and whatnot after yeah I was and i i wasn't more of a part of it i was a doubter for so long because um i i, I it was funny looking back on it that i was the the strongest voice that was like this is impossible yeah, because yeah, yeah. And the reason why wasn't because i was a hater and i whatever else is because i identified quickly that everybody viewed me as Superman and they thought that like, we're going to be fine because if we ever need free throws made, we'll just turn to Titus and he'll make him cause he never misses. And I was fully aware that I am not Superman, And I like, I don't, I don't own a Cape. There is no Cape anywhere. <laughs> I have no, I have no superpowers. And so there was just like a sense that 
uh, like even as they're mapping out how we're going to go about this, they're like, all right, so maybe Che, you hit three, and then Titus, of course, you'll hit ten in a row. Then um, Kirk, you'll hit a couple, and then Titus, you hit ten more. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to miss. Right. Like I'm going to miss. Like I'm not. I'm not perfect. And uh, so that was going through my head too, where I was like, these, everyone seems to keep thinking that like I will shoot a hundred percent. That's not going to happen. And so that's why the doubts came because everybody, if you ask people why they think we can do it, my name would be mentioned almost immediately. And if you ask me why I think we couldn't do it, it was because I know my limitations. And I was like, dude, I'm not, I'm not going to hit 26 out of the 41 every single time uh, you need me to. But, yeah, it was awesome. If you if you didn't watch it, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to recommend you go back and watch the entire stream. Watch but. the, uh, the Viva TV came out. That's the behind-the-scenes yeah. cut of it. So if you cut it up, it's, it's, it, it's a special thing, especially if you're a longtime Barstool fan. Like, yeah. It's one of those things that's going to get talked about down the road yeah viva tv's all yeah pat bev showing up was awesome mantis yeah. showing up like the whole thing was was it was it was great it was it was absolutely perfect and i think it lasted the perfect amount of time too it, it, it couldn't yeah. have been scripted any better how it all went down um including like the controversies at the end where like dave obviously stepped over the line after he released the ball and like <laughs> even that's funny because it's just like funny to have like haters like you spend 16 hours doing something and yeah. then you do it and Fault. immediately people are like asterisk doesn't count <laughs> Yeah, fake <laughs> fake um uh the only other thing i wanted to do before we got out of here was just like some chris holtman emergency podcast cleanup which um i the only, the only thing i wanted to add that i didn't talk about on the emergency show is uh i do think ohio state in in thinking through like why they fire chris holtman now i do think that ohio state and this isn't me reporting anything i don't know anything um this is just me making sense of what's going on. Um, I think Ohio State's about to take a massive swing at a at a basketball coach. That's not even wishful thinking either. That's just – I the the guy they brought in, Ross Bork – Bjork? Bjork? How do you pronounce that? B- Bjork. It's got to be BJ. Bjork? Bjork? Yes. So they, this dude they bring in from Texas A&M, um, so – he he has like a split reputation because on the one hand, he's the guy that gave Jimbo Fisher a – trillion dollars to then fire him um and he's he's not particularly great at hiring coaches um although buzz williams isn't really that bad of a hire but uh i don't know he, he it's it's a split reputation you ask people like should i be excited about this people are like i don't i don't really know the one thing though that people do say that he's very good at is fundraising he's very good at rallying the troops saying we need money give us money so we can throw it into the athletic department um so what I think is about to happen with Ohio State and the reason we fired Chris Holtman this early in, in the in the season, which it is late in the season, but, you, you know, like why he didn't finish out the rest of the year. Um, I think Bjork is getting a head start on rallying the boosters, coming up with the money. He's building a war chest. And maybe this is wishful thinking. I, don't, I, I would say this if it was another program too. This is just what I'm trying to uh, – you know, this is how I, I see the situation – I think by firing Chris Holtman in mid-February, you now have a month and a half, if not longer, to build your war chest, to go take a massive swing. Um, Will the massive swing land? I don't know. Probably not. Um, But I would not be surprised if Ohio State is trying to go at – like, I don't – like, this is my way way of saying I don't think Ohio State is trying to hire, like, Josh Schertz from Indiana State, uh, who I think is a good coach. I think he's going to have a great coaching career. Um, but I, I don't think that's where their mind's at. I don't think they're doing this to hire like an up and comer. I don't think Jeff Bowles is another name at, at Ohio university down the road was an assistant coach at Ohio state. When I was there, absolutely love Jeff Bowles. I would, I would run through a wall for Jeff Bowles. Um, but I'm just calling it like I see it. I don't, I don't think Jeff Bowles is getting a call. I don't think they're, they're going after guys like that. I think the plan is going to be to pluck a high major coach away from a good job. Um, I think, the plan is going to be to like, honest to God, it's a meme. I know it's stupid. I know me being a Buckeye, everyone's going to roll their eyes. I'm not saying he's going to take the job. I, I would not be surprised if they make a run at Billy Donovan. I do. I would not be surprised at that. I, I, you know, Billy Donovan's in year four at the bulls. He's the bulls are going nowhere. You know, I, I don't expect him to take the job. That's not what I'm saying. I just, I think that's the mindset though, that Ohio state has is that, um, I think they're going to take a big swing. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they offered John Calipari. I wouldn't be surprised if they went after like Tommy Lloyd. And I guess that's that's what I wanted to revisit is because when when I did the emergency thing, I was like, 
you got to be a little realistic here. And I think, uh, you know, you're not getting Tommy Lloyd from Arizona. I still don't think you're, you're going to, but, um, but Bjork did the two hires that stand out at Texas A&M. And I don't know if he hired more guys than this, but he pulled Buzz Williams for Virginia tech at a time when that felt shocking. When, when, when Buzz Williams, Buzz Williams left Marquette to go to Virginia tech. That was a surprise. He built Virginia tech into something special there for a second for, you know, what Virginia tech basketball is like. They were, they were pretty good there. Um, and then he just suddenly goes to Texas A and M, and when that happened, I was I was a I was pretty surprised by that. Same thing with Jimbo Fisher going to Texas A and M. That that under Ross Bjork, uh, they come up with enough money to to pluck a guy who won a national championship at Florida State and was the head coach at Florida State. They pull him out of Florida State to coach at Texas A and M, which has been kind of a hapless program in college football for a while. Um, so the the fact that he was able to do that. And now he's at a place at Ohio State that's one of the biggest athletic departments in the country. I, I just think that's where the that's where the head's going to be at. I think I think whether it's successful or not, I do expect there to be a big swing, and then we'll see what happens after that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't know if I, I that's my way of saying that like suddenly the the candidates for this job I think are infinite because I I have no idea where they're going to take this search. I th- I thought I had an idea, and I'm starting to think that like. They might make a run at like Shaka Smart. They might make a run like who's who's very happy at Marquette, has a great thing going at Marquette, is from Wisconsin. There's no reason for him to leave. But like I, I really think the attitude at Ohio State might be like, fuck it, we're getting him. And they're gonna try to like go after guys that you wouldn't even think you you would assume are happy um at the place that they're at. Uh I, I think Ohio State's going to try to to make a big swing so that's it and i also found it funny that uh lamont paris was a name that was getting tossed lamont paris is from ohio and um went to college in ohio and and all that so you know he's having a great year at south carolina he was a name that was getting thrown around a lot yesterday and for the for ohio state to fire chris holtman and lamont paris to be a name that everybody's throwing around just for him to lose by 40 that day that's a bad omen for me I, i i like lamont paris but uh that's a bad omen. On day one of of you showing why you should take the Ohio State job, you lose by forty at Auburn. Don't love it. So, um, anyway, that's that's that. That's uh, that's all I got on that front. So, uh, I'm I'm very I'm starting to talk myself into TJ like this being a good thing. Like I I'm sad for Holtman, but I I've I've kind of mourned the loss of of a good guy, and now I'm like. Fuck it, dude. Let's let's try to get Billy Donovan. I guess yeah. I don't know. It sucks he's, when you have like a gonna, personal relationship or connection with the coach too like if anything mm-hmm. if Peichel was ever in the same situation it would devastate me because he's been awesome but yeah like it is what it is yeah or you gotta you gotta right. you gotta do what needs to be done to, right. to save the program but yeah I for the record I'm gonna get killed for that I don't think Billy Donovan's gonna be the Ohio State coach no I don't, yeah. I don't. I'm not that's not what I was saying um I'm saying if you're trying to make sense of where they're going to go I don't think you should look at the up-and-comers I don't think I think I think the candidates for Ohio State are going to be guys that are already established and have already had success, and uh, they're going to throw a bunch of money at them, you know. And and I kind of hope they do. I mean, that, that's what I think the program needs. I think you need a massive jolt in the arm. How crazy would John Calipari at Ohio State be if Ohio anyway, State was anyway, like, yeah. "We're going to offer you seven million dollars a year"? Not like he's getting paid. God knows how. I think he's getting paid close to ten, if not more. Yeah. Um, but Cal's like, dude, I've worn out my welcome at Kentucky. I don't know how I'd feel about that if you yeah. gave that coach at Ohio State, but I, I, that's what that's what I think the mindset should be um, if you're trying to make sense of where Ohio State's going to go with this. And and then ultimately, you know, like we might strike out, we might try to get Billy Donovan, we might try to like get Tommy Lloyd from Arizona. And Tommy Lloyd's like, why the fuck would I leave Arizona, dude? I love it. This is that's a better program. Like what you know, which is fair. All these things are fair. Um, and then we might end up with Greg McDermott or you know like a more reasonable candidate that I said yesterday, but. Uh, yeah, sleeping on it, I'm like, I think they're going to take a huge swing. I think that's why they did this, and I think now you have more time to, like, call the boosters and say, write some checks. So, uh, Ross Bork. Bork? Bjork. Give me a call, dude. Give me a call. I'll write a check. I'll write a very fat check. You tell me where your head's at. You tell me who we're thinking, and uh, I'll pull out the pocketbooks. There's no there's no limit to the amount of zeros I'll put on that check. Because here's the thing. If you put the zeros before the number, it doesn't even mean anything. You yeah. know? Zero so I'll still. just write. Check still cashes. I'll write a bunch of zeros and then one hundred dollars. <laughs> so is that if you're going to be a booster in this situation? Are you of- officially rescinding your name from the head coaching job at Ohio State? Uh, 
No, I'm I I'm writing a check for myself. <laughs> oh. Nice. Cuz I I'm demanding a big bag from Ohio State, so I'm going to write to see that I get the job, I'm going to write a massive check self for addressed. yeah, self for myself. Uh no, I'm not removing myself. I No, you know what? I am. I'm removing myself. Mm. I'm being the bigger person. I'm going to I'm going to officially declare that I'm out of the running for the Ohio State head coaching job because I don't think that's what's best for the program. And uh, I would, though, like to run point on the search. Is that fair? Like, I, I think that I, I think my services would be better used if you let me hire the next head coach. That's fair. And uh, I'm hiring Brad Stevens. So there it is. I'm nice. going to call Brad Stevens and uh, we're going to hire him. Um, all right. That's the show. Uh, we'll be back on. But I, we're back to regular scheduled programming, right? Like no more. We're not doing any more streams or any. Are we done with the bullshit at this company? We're never done. Probably with the not. Bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird last Friday. It was weird in Vegas just to be like, so next week, uh, we might do a show. I don't really know. Yeah. We got this crazy shit going on. Uh, I think next week should be normal. I think the rest of the college basketball season should be normal. I anticipate it being normal. So we'll be back on uh, Tuesday morning. We're going to record on Monday. Enjoy the weekend, everybody. We'll see you then.